Joan Nathan is the author of 11 cookbooks, including her latest work, King Solomon's Table, a culinary exploration of Jewish cooking from around the world. Her previous cookbook, Quiches, Kugels, and Couscous, My Search for Jewish Cooking in France, was named one of the 10 best cookbooks of 2010 by NPR, Food and Wine, and Bon Appetit magazine. And in 2017, Jewish Cooking in America was named a culinary classic by the IACP. Her PBS television series, Jewish Cooking in America with Joe Nathan, was nominated for the James Beard Award for Best National Television Food Show. Joan is an inductee to the James Beard Foundation's Who's Who in American Food and Beverage, received the Silver Spoon Award from Food Arts Magazine, and was awarded a Special Recognition Award from the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research for her work to preserve Jewish foodways. The list of awards and honors that she has received goes on and on, and we just don't have time to mention them all here today. In addition to writing all of her books, Joan has appeared as a guest on numerous radio and television programs, including The Today Show, Good Morning America, The Martha, Martha Stewart Show, and National Public Radio, and has been a regular contributor to The New York Times. In addition to her love of food, Joan has a master's degree in French literature from the University of Michigan and a master's in public administration from Harvard University. It is my honor to introduce Moments Editor-in-Chief Nadine Epstein and culinary expert Joan Nathan. Nadine, you're muted. You're muted. Hi. Hi, every, everyone. And then thank you so much for joining. I'm friends with Joan. So over the years, I've been fortunate to have some wonderful taste and test some very delicious meals and food with her and um, food that she's just whipped up. And I think I'm even luckier because I'm also the beneficiary of some wonderful tales, culinary tales, culinary adventures. So when we're out for a walk or we're talking or we're eating, I get to hear these spontaneous stories about, oh, I was in this country and I just happened to bump into this person and this happened and, 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 and on and on. And it's always so wonderful. So although she has actually made a little treat for us to at least look at today, and we'll do that at the end, um, I thought it would be really wonderful in this day of no international travel and very limited domestic travel to sit back and be armchair travelers and talk to Joan. And I thought, well, we could all live a little vicariously through Joan's food travel adventures over the years, and especially some of the Jewish ones. And we, and as you'll find out, many of them are not planned adventures. Um, so I wanted to start though about, so Joan, you know, she studied French and she was studying political science and public service. And I know she was working for Teddy Kollek in Jerusalem. And then one day, voila, she became a Jewish food detective. And I'm, I guess I'd start with that adventure. How did that adventure start? Well, it probably started when I was growing up. Um, <clears throat> my father loved going to Italian restaurants and Providence, Rhode Island. And he just liked restaurants in general. And so did my mother, because my mother never liked to cook. So, and my father was German born. He spoke fluent Italian. He spoke French. Wherever we went, he would talk to the waiters. And I realized that so much came out from them. And we also, he also would speak to chefs if he got to. And I realized there was another dimension to food than just a, just what the dish on the table. And I loved, you know, going with him. And I think that really fueled my interest through the years. And it, you know, it, it and then it, Teddy Colick in a way was like my father. He had the exact same accent as my father in English. He only spoke, well, he spoke Hebrew, but he didn't write Hebrew, he didn't read Hebrew. So it was English and German, just like my dad. Really? And uh, yeah, so, and oh, my father also felt that a young girl had to go to France. That was part of an education. And it just happened that he had relatives in France. 
So when I was about 17 years old, I went from my first trip and lived with a family in, uh, in a near Annecy. I was at the University of Grenoble, but my relatives all lived in Annecy. And he had some business associates around Europe and he had me staying all over the place. So that, that, that really fueled me too. Wow. So what was your first food adventure? Maybe mm -hmm. your first food adventure, professional food adventure, or was there, you were, you were in Israel, you suddenly, I mean, something happened that made you want to change trying to tracks in your life. Well, I think when I was in Jerusalem and I went with Teddy Kalik um, to uh, different villages and also Arab villages and to, um, to, to like the white Russian church and the red Russian church in Jerusalem. And wherever we went, we got food. You were his assistant, right? What were I you? was a foreign press attaché. Foreign press, okay. So, so as foreign press attaché, you went traveling through these and you... Well, my happened? job was to learn everything there was to know about Jerusalem and okay. to impart that to journalists that only wanted to learn about the political story. So okay. I tried to detract them and show them that there was another part of Jerusalem. And I had this idea that we would go that I would invite the, the journalists' wives to cooking classes in different people's homes that were part of the history of Jerusalem, Jews, Christians, and Muslims. And it worked, and sometimes the journalists came too. And then I got this idea, why don't we write a cookbook? And I wrote it with another person, uh, Judy Stacy Goldman, who worked for Teddy Collick. And um, that, that book became The Flavor of Jerusalem, which I think we sold about 25,000 copies, which was a good, first of all, it was the first good book. It was good in those days, but it would have been better today because, you know. And, um, and I, we, I only did that as a lark, and that became a career for me because then I went to the, I came back to the States and I, I had come back before it was published, but then I got married and um, we moved to Boston and uh, the Boston, the editor of the Boston Globe asked if I would like to write about, write for the Globe. And I had thought I would just write about ethnic groups in Boston, which would have been fun. And he saw my book and he said, well, why don't you write about ethnic groups and food? Oh, that's great. Yeah, so that's really how it started. And I saw that in an early, because Moment started in 1975 in Boston, mm -hmm. and very early on, you had a food story. Maybe it was your first, was it your first printed food story in Moment? It could have been. Oh, for sure it was. It was about gefilte fish, and I can't even remember, but wait, what was the editor's name? Because I remember his coming over, it must have been. Um, Leonard Fine, Leonard Fine. Leonard Fine came, Did he, he come over and taste the gefilte fish? Uh, probably. He was a friend <laughs> of Hugh Nissenson, and Hugh was visiting us in Boston. I'm pretty sure this is the story. And <laughs> Hugh wanted him to come for dinner. Um, so he came for dinner, and then we talked, and he said, well, why don't you write about gefilte fish? So I did. <laughs> We're going to look for that story in the archives. Well, it was also a story about French food, because that's what I really loved, and the, the similarity between gefilte fish and I forget what that the, the French dish is. You just made me think about it. Um, you know, the, it's such a good dish. What's it called? It's a, it's like gefilte like a, fish. Like a mousse, like a fish mousse of some kind? Yes, like a fish mousse. Um, a a salmon mousse? Or a... No, it's, no, no. It's, it's made of uh, mostly um, pike and carp. And uh, several people are saying quenelles. Yeah, quenelle. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. But it, thank the, you, to, the thank is, you to all the many, many people, so right. many people just. <laughs> 
Uh, it's just that I'm out in California now and I'm not thinking about <laughs> French food, but uh, yeah, canal, which I love, absolutely love to this day. But canal is much lighter and we sort of compare, we had a lot of fun with that article, comparing them and yeah, it was, it, and it was really good uh, visuals in the article. We should find it and republish it. Yeah. It sounds like a great oh, idea. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I'm going to ask you about some specific countries and adventures. Canel de Brochet. Canel de Brochet. That's Great. what it's called. Um, but first I thought, do you have, um, like, it seems like, do you, what's the first thing you do when you get to a town? And you, you're, you're coming to a town, you, you write about food, you want to learn about food. Where do you, where do you go? Well, what I, what I first, well, of course I go to the markets. There's no question about that. Uh -huh. But what I do is before I'm going, I find, I think about who is the person that really knows something. And, you know, as you said that, I immediately thought of Jonathan Gold, the late, you know, beloved uh, Jonathan Gold, who was the food editor of the LA Times. And he was the only um, food editor to win a Pulitzer. And so Jonathan, I, like I, I remember wherever I went in Italy, for example, I would always ask him where to go. And he would like drive a hundred miles out of his way for one meal, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, wherever he was. And um, so that's what I, I still do it to this day. One of, I just got to LA and uh, my first phone call was to uh, the food writer, one of the food writers from the New York Times here, just to find out what, what was going on. And uh, what's going on food wise? Yeah, and where I should go and where I should have some fun. Okay. And, you know, so it, it's really important to know either speaking to um, rest and, it, you know, it's not necessarily a restaurant critic that knows everything and you don't necessarily find the best things through other people. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was um, the last big trip that Alan and I were on before he died was we took a trip with our really good friends, uh, the other couple, Kathy and Joe, and we went to, I had been leading a New York Times trip um, to Italy and Alan was with me. And then we went to Sicily with Kathy and Joe. And I remember one of the, we, we would find these little towns and you just talk to somebody and you find, that's for me the best way to find something you know, stumble on something. And that's what we did all over Sicily. I mean, I just got so many good stories out of it. Well, I was gonna ask you, so you don't, do you have, you have some kind of overall strategy or do you really just go and be open to what is there? Well, I'm, I'm open to what is there. I do have a strategy and I, I know, you know, I'm always interested in Jewish food. So I try to find somebody who is going to invite me over or uh, knows other people that, I mean, it, it depends on what I'm after. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I love being able to find these recipes so that they can live again. That's so you, really, you mentioned yeah. um, Morocco. You were, t I think it was either Seville or Morocco and you were there and you were walking around with your son, maybe a long time ago, oh, and you were walking through the shook in the market and you smelled something incredible. What did you do? Well, I don't remember it was Morocco or Syria. It was, was in the Jewish well, quarter. It was in, it was in Morocco. Okay. And actually both the Seville and Morocco, similar things, but with my son, it was in Morocco. It was a town called Asila. And Alan and I went there almost every year for years because the mayor of the town, who was also the foreign minister of um, Morocco and once the ambassador to the United States, and a very, he and my husband were like brothers. So Alan would go to this conference every year and I would sometimes accompany him, not always, because I really don't like to travel in the summer. It's too, especially to places like Morocco, they're so hot. And we have better beaches on Martha's Vineyard. So I just, I don't go any place. But anyway, so we would go there and um, 
David was invited as an artist one summer because our friend always has a big conference of, of mostly Arabs, but sometimes other people too. And we were wandering around the Warrens of the old city, which is where our friend lives. His name is Mohammed Ben Aisa. And we just followed our nose. And I knocked on the door and I asked them what they were cooking. And they were cooking a couscous that smelled exactly like the couscouses that I really love. And um, they asked us to stay for lunch, which we stayed for a little bit. Then I realized that we were invited to Mohammed's for a meal. So we raced back to the Ben Aisa's and, um, and they couldn't believe that I just wandered in. But, you know, I, I didn't take the recipe because I didn't really need it, but I really got a good taste of what a family has in, in Morocco. So you were just walking through the market, you smelled something delicious, you knocked on the door and were invited in to eat. Right, that happens to me all the time. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Um, <laughs> Not all the time. Wonderful, that's a wonderful, that's just fabulous. Um, you were also telling me sometimes you're actually really searching for something. And once you said you were, you were, you were in Provence and you were, you were drive, you want, you drove two hours to some restaurant because you were looking for some specific Jewish food. And it turned out that food didn't exist, but tell us the story. Oh, okay. Well, I was writing my cook, my book, um, uh, Kish Couscous, wait a minute, Kish couscous and kugels on the yeah, food this one here. quiche kugels and couscous yeah. yeah one of my app i love all my books but that happens to be one that's very close to my heart anyway and of course i was looking for jewish chefs excuse me and i found a lot in france that nobody believed that they were jewish even the jewish people for some reason I always bring out the Jewishness in people. <laughs> anyway, so somebody had told me, Richard Pearl had told me that, um, that this woman named Elizabeth Bourgeois was Jewish. And um, so I went all the way to, I was in, in near Vans. I was in actually in Vans. And we drove all the way to um, Gord. We went to this stone restaurant it was beautiful with olive trees around we went inside it was almost two o'clock and restaurants close in france at two o'clock and i said to, and i speak fluent french so i went up to elizabeth elizabeth bourgeois she was at the door we didn't make a reservation we just came and uh i i said uh vous êtes juive and and she said pas du tout not at all and then we sat, it was two o'clock and we were hungry and I thought, oh my God, I've come all this way. And so we sat down to eat and she, we had this delicious tomato salad that reminded me of a cooked Moroccan Jewish salad that I love very much. And I said, what's that? She said, oh, ça c'est la salade juive, that's Jewish salad. And I, a, a, a woman who worked for me, it's her recipe. So she gave me the recipe and we've become very, very good friends. I brought her to Washington for sips and supper. She came for years. And then after, not that day, but after many uh, visits, she would stay at my house in Washington. And finally her husband said, you know, and he didn't speak, he spoke a little bit of English. He spoke none at all. He said, I think that her forebears were Jewish. And anyway, so, you know, you, you never know how or what you're going to get, but I think it's really important, two things. One is to stay open. The other thing is, well, three things. One is to stay open, just have an open mind. The second thing is to visit the people that you want to get to. And um, what's, there's a third one, but anyway, th those two are the most important. And oh, I know, to give yourself extra time. Ah, so you can talk you know, to people. It's like when you're writing, when I'm writing something, I put down my pen a lot yeah. and then a lot comes out. Uh -huh. When they think that there's no, when they, you know, it's like when my mother-in-law used to, I would drive her and my uh, father-in-law to the the plane or the train when wherever they were leaving us. And they realized that it was, 
time to leave. Then they would tell me the really good stories about their past. <laughs> and it's the same thing. Well, you must know that as a writer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, actually, I remember that in that story you told me, though, the person the chef got the recipe from was her her house cleaner. Right. Well, she was she, she was a cleaner in the restaurant. Oh, a cleaner in the restaurant. Okay. Right. So right. you learn from everybody. Well, every, to be you learn know, from the chef. Every one of listen. I've talked to Jose Andres a lot because he's a very good friend of mine, and he says you don't think that we get everything from every single person in our restaurant that lives in a foreign country. That's where we get our ideas from. Yeah. And if you don't, that's your fault. Yes, we have to learn from everybody we bump into. Right. Um, so sometimes you, I think another story you told me, sometimes you're looking for something and then you find it and it's not at all what you want. And you told me a story about once about, you were in Czechoslovakia yeah. and you were in search of a restaurant for, and forgive my pronunciation, Skvetchen noodle. Right. Um, and what ha tell us the Skvetchen noodle story. <laughs> well, this is a dish that I've had, I must have had it a long, long time ago that was so delicious. And it was a, you take a plum or you take an apricot and you make like a potato dough, you, ro you r boil it with the dough around the fruit you boil it and then you saute it in butter and sugar and nuts mm -hmm. and it's delicious. Well, um, I think it was the late Mark Talisman who, before we went to Prague, he knew somebody in Prague and he said, go to the opera restaurant and the person they know how to make this. So again, we were with Alan and I were with Kathy and Joe who we seem to always be around, thank goodness. And we went to Prague, we went to this restaurant and this guy really didn't know how to make it. And it was horrible. And we were all around him. You know, when people make it for you, they're watching you. And he left for a second. We took a little, one of us took a bite of it. We just thought, oh, this is horrible. So they threw it in the waste of your basket, but I had to eat it just, you know, and I ate it and it, it wasn't. So I wanna, I'm still in search of that recipe. <laughs> but it's it's really one of the great recipes. So you also told me another interesting story about you were in Jordan, and again, forgive my pronunciation, and you were talking to someone and you were looking for kanafi. Right, kanafi. And so you were visiting someone. Tell us that the kanafi story. Well, um, I was at. Harvard, getting my master's in public administration because I had worked for mayors. And um, there was a, a class with uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan that everybody wanted to get into. And because I, and only 15 people could get into it. So there was somebody, I was, we were in this auditorium and there must've been 150 people that wanted to get into that class because it was just, he had just come back as ambassador. He was going to run for senator in New York. And this was going to be the one semester that he'd be there. So he said, look at, you can look at who's in front of you and back of you. Only one of you is going to get in this class. So I went up to him. My husband really wanted me to be in this class. In the, his, <laughs> uh, so I, I went up to him and I said that I work for Teddy Colick, mayor of Jerusalem. And he said, oh, he, you know, it was an honor for him that I would do that. So I got into the class and one of the other people in the class was this guy named um, Adnan Abu Odeh, who was number six, his car was number six in Jordan. He was the minister of information and he was, he had a semester at the Kennedy school. So um, Adnan, I went up to him and I said, you know, there are two things that I really love in the world. Oh, I, I, this is a different story. This wasn't in Jordan. Okay, well, I'll tell you. One is um, Musachan, which is a chicken with pine nuts and onions and all kinds of delicious things, and also kanafi. So he invited me over to his house. He said to me, invite me to your house and I'll show you how to make Musachan, which he did. And he, we, we've, worked, we've been friends our whole life. But the kanafi, Alan was getting his um, 
he was writing a book on the legal uh, legal aspects of um, the military occupation uh, in the West Bank. So we went to the West Bank and he interviewed the mayor of Nablus. And they had like two hours, they were talking and this guy was giving him all the PLO you know, line and I was getting bored because I was and, and it was <laughs> time to eat. So I asked, I said, can I ask you a question? Is it true that the best kanafi in the Middle East is in Nablus? And he looked at his watch and he said, not Nablus, in my house. Have you had lunch yet? <laughs> so we went to his house and of course he didn't make it. He bought it. Everybody does. No one makes it at their house. You get it in from bakeries in Jerusalem, in the old city. There's wonderful kanafi called Jaffer kanafi. You can also get Jaffer kanafi in, uh, believe it or not, in, in um, Virginia now. But anyway, so you know, it, it. But what was amazing about this meeting was that it broke down the ice between Alan and this mayor. I forget his name. And they just talked and talked, and um, that was it. That was. So you you're know. saying you got you got a lot more uh, honest conversation occurred after the kanafi was eaten. Well, and it, which just proves my point about breaking yeah. the ice. And that's you know when Teddy Kollek was able to break the ice with communities one way over food, the other way over making good jokes. Uh huh people and that, that you know it's so it's something that has made me realize that if you like people's food especially poorer people I have to tell you um you're going to endear yourself to them and you'll get whatever recipes you want and you know it's like like me like my food mm -hmm. if you like my food then you like me and a lot of women especially are so proud of it I mean I I, I remember Moroccan women especially, they were very, very proud of their own foods and they would not give them up readily, um, you know, from different small communities. It was like, this is my pride and I'm not going to give it to you. And I, I even saw that with my own aunt who was German and my mother had wanted her Gesundheitskuchen recipe, which is like a lemon, very simple lemony cake and she wouldn't Liesl always left out an ingredient for my mother and <laughs> but then when I started to write cookbooks she saw her own immortality through my books and after my Jewish holiday kitchen came out and she was in it all over the place she gave me this beautiful salt cup that she had gotten Actually, it was a buttercup, but I would use it for salt. Silver that's really quite beautiful that had been in our family since about the 18th century. And she said, this is for making me immortal. So she entrusted you with recipes that she wouldn't entrust with your mother. Right, exactly. Ah, <laughs> that's pretty cool. And then it also happens, uh, a, another thing happens that, that I learned when you're writing a cookbook or when you're, when you're putting somebody in print, don't call them just after you've done the article. Let, for a lot of people, being in print is very scary. So their first reaction might be negative mm -hmm. because of this fear. So wait a few days and then let them call you. Don't you call them. I remember the first article, I one of the first articles I wrote was about a woman named Ada Baum Lipschitz, who was a wonderful Jewish cook in Boston. And um, when I, I was so excited about this article and, and I called her and the first thing that happened was she said, oh, my sister is so jealous. And, you know, she, she had to, that her sister must've been nasty to her when she called or she, you know, that she was so excited she was in the Boston Globe. So you just learn to just hold back. <laughs> uh -huh. So is there some other wonderful food adventure, a Jewish food adventure you want to tell us about? 
I know you mentioned, you've told me about Sri Lanka, but something, I mean, any, any other food that you bumped into by mistake? Well, let me just think that I bumped into by mistake. Well, I, everything is by mistake. You yeah. know, everything, wherever you go. I mean, when I was in Sri Lanka, I was on the side of a road you know, eating the kind of things that my kids think I'm nutty to eat. And there was this bread and it tasted so much like a babka without um, chocolate, you know, the way they used to make babkas. And I thought to myself, but you know, it was, it was a, Sri Lanka is famous for its cinnamon, Ceylon cinnamon. So I kept thinking, where's the Jewish connection here? I mean, it, it just tasted like home. You know, yeah, in the middle of, of that. yeah, go ahead, yeah. Um, but but there was a Sri Lankan, a Jewish connection way, way, way back, which is cinnamon, and this goes back to like the twelfth, eleventh century, that that Jewish merchants would go to Sri, well, to Ceylon, and um, in fact, Moses Maimonides' brother died on a journey from Yemen to Ceylon in search of spices. Really? Uh, he was a merchant, yeah. And Sorry. so, you know, but, but the point is that Jewish history is so far back there that it's mostly forgotten. But you figured it out? Well, I, I looked at the Geniza and I, I, I spent a lot of time looking at the Geniza, you know, and, and it's, it's interesting. You, have to look at a lot of bills of lading, um, all kinds of, I, I looked at letters and I learned a lot about the ancient world and what Jewish spice merchants did. Sometimes if, if they had a friend, they would hide the spices in uh, uh, rice that they were sending yes. because, uh, because there were taxes on spices, especially spices like cardamom that were, um, gave men virility. Uh, you know, these are things that you just don't know anything about, at least, you know. That sounds amazing. Um, so also, you know, you've told, you've mentioned to me public ovens. Public ovens are so fascinating. We don't have public ovens anymore, at least right. in the United States, at least as far as I know. But, but it seems like you were, you, you bumped into more than your share of public ovens. Tell us about public ovens. Well, public ovens were what people, for centuries and centuries, that people used. And um, what I do whenever I find a public oven that's still working, like in Fez, I don't know if it's still there, but in Asila for sure is still there. Um, and I realized the public oven is the center of life. You know, you give the uh, baker a tiny, a few, like maybe a quarter, or equivalent of a quarter, and he'll bake whatever you, very often women would bring these uh, trays on their head and they might have a, 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 a mark of, of that it's theirs. They, give it to him and then he'll bake it. So in Morocco and in each, depending on where you are, the, the rotation is different. Like in Morocco um, or in Asila, cause it might be different in Fez and other places. First of all, there had been Jewish public ovens and then there were non-Jewish public ovens, but they were almost right next door to each other. So, you know, there are no Jewish ones now cause they were 50% Jewish by the way, before the end of the, well, the end of the 19th century when a lot of them went to, um, Jews went to Brazil for the rubber industry. Um, but in a sila, the first thing they would do, a, a public oven wanted something high to take peppers and just to have them peeled. You know, if you put them in a high oven, they'll be, so you, people would come in the first when it was very hot. Then they would um, come, maybe for bread and you'd see all these people with bread on their heads mm -hmm. and then uh, maybe you would want to cook fish and you know as it got hotter or colder or maybe you would want to cook a bastille which made the people that were talking to the baker 
just let him them him know that somebody was having a birthday or an engagement party. Bastia, you know, is this wonderful dough that we use with um, phyllo, but they use something called warka. And um, inside it might be a, a pigeon or it's cooked down with an egg mixture with pine nuts and cinnamon and sugar. It's one of the great delicacies of Morocco and um, absolutely delicious. So that was, you know, you'd know something was happening or you'd notice that somebody was dying. It, it was, you just know all these things. And I've noticed um, a similar pattern in the Caribbean, I've been told they, they have a lot of public ovens, different towns, and it's just the way it was the way of life until uh, the middle of the 19th century all over the world. I know, I think we've, we've written about Cholent and how people prepared Cholent in Eastern Europe, Jews, in, public ovens. always in the public ovens. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, the funny thing is I wrote an article on that, that was um, the, the, the editor at the Times, one of the editors wasn't that interested in the article. And then we switched and the new editor was Pete Wells, who's now the restaurant critic. And I told him, you know, there's this article, but I really think it should be printed. And he took one look at it. He said, absolutely, it should be printed. And he, he was, I, I love Pete, but anyway, so um, then when, when it was, it was also repeated in the French newspapers and the Arabic newspapers all over the world. Because mm -hmm. there's, in Arab world, there's still public ovens as well. Oh, for sure. Yes. And, so, and in Africa, of course. Ah, have you had, do you have any African Jewish tales, Jewish food tales? Um, oh, yeah. Ethiopia, what? Ethiopia. Oh. I mean, Ethiopia is the most interesting country. Um, first of all, they're the, they were the first Christian, pure Christian country, fourth century. Also, a lot of Armenians there. Um, and, but they all trace their background to Moses, who came there um, came to Ethiopia, they say, uh, while he was wandering in the desert. And he, uh, you know, of course, Queen of Sheba was actually in Yemen, but it didn't matter. Um, they, they, they think of them that they were descended from him. And the Ark of the Covenant, they think, is in, in Aksum in, um, in Ethiopia. But what's so interesting, they, they, they think of themselves as descended from the Jews. And they, there's very little pork because of the Jews. I mean, there's virtually no pork. In, in fact, when the Italians under Mussolini took over Ethiopia, they had, um, uh, what's it called, motadella, which they usually put pork in, but um, it's, at, it's of, of chicken. That's what yeah. to this day is in Ethiopia. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and, you know, and I mean, I got some Ethiopian Jewish recipes, but from Ethiopians that I found in uh, Detroit, uh, because I, I did, I mean, I, I ate with some Ethiopians, but I only like recipes that I really like, and I'm not wild about most of these Ethiopian recipes, but even so, I learned so much about, you know, they have lots of fast days, something like 270 fast days, but in a way they're a little bit like Jewish fast days. And uh, like you started sundown. Right. And sundown right. to sundown fast days. Right. And, um, but, uh, you know, I learned more about Jewish traditions coming down in Ethiopia than Jewish food, but, you know, certainly, it, 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 you know, it's there and it's not so separate because they've lived together for 400 years. And don't forget Jewish food, except for the dietary laws. And of course, Ethiopians have even more stringent dietary laws, yeah. um, is regionalized everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. So Jewish food in Ethiopia is Ethiopian. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
but but we can learn more to, i think about the early jewish food from the yemenite but yemenite in ethiopia at one point you know it was abyssinia and they were connected but yemenite food it, it and ethiopian food shows with, that jews were um disconnected from the rest of jewry about the before the second century so they have no hanukkah for example yeah they learned about hanukkah in this country and other places and both well, of them like that i'd love to ask you more questions about the art like the yemenite jewish food but i think um i want to ask you a couple other really quick questions and then we have i know other people want to ask you questions sorry if i'm too long -winded. no 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 it's fascinating i'm having a great time and i i i also so if you want to tell us a quick thing about yemenite food jewish food have you been to yemen were you in yemen at one time no i would love to go to yemen but another know, another time not yet well it's just not right now it's not the that's not the but time. but that's one of the one of my first i thought great stories and it was the first story i ever wrote for the new york times was on yemenite jewish food and unfortunately that day the times was on strike so the my story was not, it was printed, but no, not very well read. However, there were a lot of comments because I said that Jews ate locusts in Yemen. And people said, Jews couldn't eat locusts, you know, that kind of thing. But I, I'm befriended, and you probably know this place too, this, um, a, a, a jeweler uh, in Jerusalem, right near the King David Hotel. And he was a rabbi and he, you know, it was a beautiful face and they invited me to their home. And so I went there before the fast of Yom Kippur and I had such delicious um, soup, but that's soup, soupy stew, what they ate. And of course, I play this game with myself. It's like pre-Columbian, post-Columbian and there were potatoes in it and tomatoes, both post-Columbian. And, um, but they, you know, they, they were dipping sauces like the Ethiopians, flatbread like the, but different flatbread. Uh, Cause he, you know, in Ethiopia, they didn't have a lot of flour. So they had injera. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes. But even so there's a flour, it's called dabo and that's the Shabbat bread. And in, and the, and the Geniza, you see letters coming telling the telling people that i'm sending you flour so you can make a shabbat bread 13th century wow anyway, and, and so in yemen they were cut off for 2000 years from um you know jews and you know i i sort of wonder like um the tug which is green hot sauce and the harissa, which is red, it's pretty much the same thing. You know, how did these things develop and who brought them? Because, you know, they supposedly brought all the hot peppers from the new world. But, you, you know, I, I have a feeling right, that- Harissa might have developed separately in yeah. Africa, in Yemen. That's, yeah. lots of times foods did. Right. Um, so, um, is there, any particular spice or implement in your cupboard that has an adventure to it that um well uh, one of you the, have with you well actually i don't have this one with me but the uh, yeah i do I, I brought with me from washington this little pouch and um my friend oh my god it smells so good from morocco Mohammed Ben Aisa, the last time he visited us, he always brings me something, but he brought me this. And this is a huge pack of really good saffron. I thought I'd bring some for my kids. And saffron smells so good. Most really good, uh, uh, most saffron in this quantity is not really saffron. It's, um, what do you Marigold, call it? You said? Mums. Mums? Okay, yeah. I can right here smell exactly what it is, but it's, this is the real deal. And it's not. Can you show mums. it to us in the camera so we can see it? Ah, yeah. so it's not the powder. It's it the actual. Real, 
the real deal. And it's, yeah. this must be hundreds and hundreds. I don't know where he got it from. Because when I was spent a lot of time in Egypt when I was younger, and they would have just these mounds of gold powder. And well, those, I, weren't, those were not, that was fake. That's that where I got fake. I remember buying it and bringing back bags of it to give his gifts. But I don't think it was really saffron. No, it um, wasn't. Oof, it so, so good. And then, by the way, people would use this. They use turmeric as a poor man's saffron. And Jews would do that too. Jews use, and Jews, Sephardic Jews and a lot of Middle Eastern Jews use this, uh, use turmeric because they can't afford saffron in so many soups and stews. Well, turmeric is also wonderful. So, oh, yeah. is, um, so I, know, are you, I, I, I know that you're writing a memoir and I'm just wondering, is it a food memoir of your life? Isn't any good cookbook a memoir? I was just curious. <laughs> My cookbooks, I guess, are, but this is sort of the stories behind the stories. And okay. it's a personal time for me to be personal. It's my memoir. Um, you know, I, somebody asked me if her husband was going to be in it. And he, he's not related to my, because he's somebody that I knew in Israel. And he's not related to my, you know, there's, it has to be directly related to my life. And a lot of things you're not going to, are not going to be in it. Um, it, it just depends, but it, it's called, the working title is Joan Nathan, A Life in Search of Recipes. Okay. And so, you know, I'm only up to when I went to Israel. That's where I'm writing right now. So we, we don't, we won't expect it for a while. You, right. It'll, it'll be out probably in two years. Okay. And um, since you've made at least me very hungry in all your descriptions of all these delicious foods, can you show us what you made for us today? Yeah, <laughs> we well, can I like made... curiously look at it. So th these Higher, are... Let's see. Here. Can you see it? Oh, now lower, lower, yeah. Well, how's that? Ah. And, uh, what are they? What are they called? They're called gorabia. Mm. And these are Egyptian, but they're also... They're, they're like butter cookies. They're like shortbread. They're like um, corumbiades, which are the Greek. They're like uh, um, New Mexican, uh, Mexican wedding cookies, Italian wedding cookies. So they're, they're just butter cookies. Um, and the, the, I, I'll tell you how I got them. When I was young, my father made me take French from an Egyptian lady who was an immigrant, a brand new immigrant to um, Providence, Rhode Island. And, and as I'm writing my memoir, I realized she, I really could thank her. He, he wanted, he met her, he tried, he thought, how can I help this woman? He thought, I'll have her tutor my daughter after school. I want her to learn French. This is to go to Annecy, right? And he nice. felt that if I learned more French, I'd be better in Annecy, which he was right. My father was always right and I fought him tooth and nail. Anyway, so then um, I hadn't thought about this woman whose name was Mrs. Baghdadi uh, in 50 years. So I called the Rhode Island Jewish Historical Society and I asked them if there was a woman named Mrs. Baghdadi that was there in, 19, in the 1959. And they said, yes, her name was Marie Baghdadi and she moved to Rockville with her husband. So I looked in the phone book and there was you know, a lot of um, Arab Baghdadis. And then there was one, somebody named, I think Arnon or Arlon, it was her son who was a, a lawyer and then um, I noticed some younger people too. So I called um, this Mr. Baghdadi's office and I said, my name is Joan Nathan. I'm looking for a woman who tutored me in French and she made a really good butter cookie. So he called me back and he said, that was my mother. Oh. And, um, and then he said, I don't remember any butter cookies, but his children remembered the butter cookies. And uh, so he got me the recipe, and this is my first testing of it. Oh, what a wonderful story. 
Yeah, it's That's really perfect. Take a bite for us. Ah, okay. <laughs> Um, what a perfect story, and that's a beautiful way, uh, a perfect food detective story, a personal yeah. one, and it's a perfect, perfect way to, uh, I wish we had more time, but to segue into some questions. And Suzanne? Yes, thank you so much. I know everybody is extremely hungry now, and uh, I'm sure going to go to Amazon tonight and buy some of your books to try out some of your recipes. Oh, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so someone emailed in a question earlier um, about when you're developing your recipes for, um, when you're developing your recipes, do you improvise on a standard dish or to, to make it your own? Um, I mean, how much of your cookbooks are your recipes that you've created from scratch versus what you've taken from others? Um, how does that come about? Okay, so what, as opposed to a lot of other people who don't care that much about the tradition, I try to find recipes that are traditional that people have used but try to make them more modern with less fat and more usable. So I think a recipe through, I'm just creating one right now for the New York Times. Um, I, I don't wanna say what it is, but so that's, you know, I sort of think about it. So for example, this recipe, um, the woman, the, uh, the woman that did it used um, clarified butter. I don't think people are gonna really wanna use clarified butter. So I've made it the first time with clarified butter, the next time I'm gonna do it just with regular butter and see if it makes a difference to make them easier. I do, sometimes I create recipes, but I usually start with something and I make it my own. And I always um, let you know who's given me the recipe. Mm -hmm. Uh, what do you uh, prefer more? What do you enjoy more? Talking to the people and finding out the stories and then becoming their storyteller or actually spending time in the kitchen and creating food? Both. As long as I have somebody in the kitchen to clean up. Then <laughs> <laughs> That's the key. <laughs> Um, somebody wanted to let you know uh, that uh, they are of Hungarian background and they have a family recipe of the um, plum dumplings, the oh. canoodle, and we will make sure that you get that recipe. Oh, where, where do they live? That um, I do not, um, I don't know. Everybody, you should put it in the chat and we'll, say, we'll be able to save the chat. Yeah. And the Q&A and we'll be able, I see a lot of people have written mm -hmm. notes to Joan. We'll try to save it and then we can share some of yeah, that information. We'll definitely with her. do that. Okay. Um, so, but so I, can, I, I can, I don't mind giving my email out or they can get me on my website, joannathan.com. That's where most that's people, yeah. we'll, also, we'll send you a copy of everything too. Yeah. I would love to have that recipe. Um, someone would, would like to know that in this, uh, in these pandemic election year times, what are some of your favorite go-to comfort foods? What dishes do you like to make most that soothe the soul? Soothe the soul? Well, I have a, a, a pot of soup right now for my kids. Um, that's one of my favorites. It's called Harira. It's a Moroccan soup. I, it's perfect for this time of year. It's with chickpeas and lentils and all kinds of uh, vegetables and um, harissa and it's <clears throat> just do you have a recipe for it, it? in King Solomon's table you can get the it recipe can, maybe we'll find it yeah uh, well, if it, we, we'll find it I, I think I'd like to make it this week it's and you can you it, it uh, here's an I example of how I changed it well first of all this this is the best recipe I've ever seen for it was the editor of the um, LA Jewish journal, David Swiss's mother's recipe. And she lives in Morocco. Uh, she's from Morocco, but she lives in Montreal. And, um, but the difference between her recipe and a lot of other people's, and I'll tell you about, is that she uses like a, a slurry of lemon, flour, and, um, and an egg and water to, to make it 
just better. And I didn't have flour in my, I thought there was no flour in my son's kitchen because he's not here. So I made it with cornmeal and it still was great. But it, but the thing is that Harira was originally a Moroccan Arab dish for Ramadan. Mm -hmm. And a lot of Arabs work for Jews. The Jews tasted this dish and they started using it to break the fast of Yom Kippur. Oh, wow. Wow. And the thing is that I make it um, a, a, vegetable, a vegetarian version because so many people are vegetarian. Usually there's meat in it. Mm -hmm. have, have you actually seen through the years from when you first started creating recipes, uh, how people's taste in food have changed? Absolutely. Very, first of all, when I first started writing about food, I was one of the few people, and this is tooting my own horn, that because I had been to Israel, I had seen other kinds of cooking. So Jewish food was just Ashkenazi at that point. And I started showing food that wasn't Ashkenazi. So, you know, that was one of the big things. The other thing is people are eating much less meat. I mean, it's just clear and especially my kids you know and they're also having much easier meals I mean how often do you have desserts I you know I always think thought well you always have to have desserts but you don't and um, you know people are just much more careful about what they're eating mm -hmm. I mean I, I can tell you one funny story I was at a break the fast for Yom Kippur and I, we, it was a, a potluck women's break the fast. And they, there were about six women, this was on Martha's Vineyard. And I made these really good rugelach that I've just learned to make from a place called, called Hof Kelsen in Montreal, filled with um, either raspberry, but good raspberry or strawberry jail, drink, jam and then um, nuts toasted nuts and I made it figuring these people they're really thin you know and that they wouldn't eat any <laughs> every one of them and these are bigger than the ones that we usually see today you know they're tiny because so you won't eat a lot they not only ate theirs but they all took the others home <laughs> for either their husband or whatever or for themselves for the next day these are women that you knew never eat because they're beautiful <laughs> anyway so <laughs> i don't know why i'm telling you that story. <laughs> we, we have, yeah, we, we've all been we've all had dinner parties with those kinds of people who don't want to eat it but they really do want to eat it um <laughs> have uh, someone would like to know have you ever found in your travels to various countries that there's a disagreement as to what foods are considered kosher oh yeah Absolutely. And I think a lot of people just don't know. And also Sephardic Jews are much more lenient in some ways than Ashkenazi Jews. And of course, that depends on where they're from. So, you know, and there's, there's always been disagreement throughout history. It's just different disagreement, you know, like kosher, um, what constitutes a kosher deli? It, it, yeah, there's all, a lot of people will eat, um, what do you call it, Arab kosher meat, uh, halal. halal meat, other people won't. Um, there, there used to be a controversy about, do you eat eggs with meat or what are eggs considered? Or um, it, it just changed. Mm -hmm. Uh, we only have time, unfortunately, for a few more, but somebody had uh, written in and wanted to know, are there any healthy substitute ingredients for some of your favorite Jewish traditional dishes? Comes to mind schmaltz. Is there a good substitute for that? <laughs> Not really. I mean, I think schmaltz is, I, I, the only time I really use schmaltz today is uh, with, for matzo balls. And I figure there's so little schmaltz in it that it's not going to help anybody. Um, I mean, you know, you could use olive oil, you could use a coconut oil. It, it's not the same. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. Uh, what sets European food apart from American food? 
you know, that when you said that, I thought, well, I thought you were going to say what sets European eating. I mean, lots of matters <laughs> quietly. Um, <laughs> it, it depends on the European food, the European country. There, there's a lot of, there's just customs that are different. Okay. And someone would like to know if you could give an example of a Polish Jewish food. Uh, well, yeah. Ch chicken with onions and um, farfel or what, kasha varnishkas, you know, um, a, a lot of Polish food really came from Germany and then, you know, went east. Um, a gefilte fish as we know it, but it was also started in, Ger in Alsace in Germany, came east. Uh, a lot of kugels, uh, tsimis, the, but they're all Russian, Polish, uh, you know, and there was so much wandering around. Uh, I'll tell you what is definitely Polish is um, a tsimis of a vegetable tsimis, carrots and um, maybe sweet potatoes, mm -hmm. but no meat at all. But with meat, it's more Russian. Great. Um, and I think to wrap it up, uh, do you have a favorite food that you like to make? Like that's your go-to? You. Well, I like making challah every Friday. I really love doing that. And I love making it seasonally. Right now I'm doing lots of different, right here I'm in California, I'm going to make it um, with a lot of rosemary this weekend. And it, it's very satisfying to me especially to give it to my kids that will love it. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely something I think during these times of the pandemic, uh, we've seen a resurgence of people making challah all over the country and posting um, on social media. So uh, if you have a favorite recipe, maybe you could share it with us uh, later and we will send it out to everybody as well. So at this point, we've reached our hour. I'm sorry we could not get to all of the questions. Um, there have been some specific questions that we will try and get answered and uh, send it out to everybody. Um, thank you. You, Joan for sharing your stories uh it was just really fascinating to listen to I know everybody really enjoyed it thank you Nadine uh wanted to let everybody know again please go to our website at momentmag.com and uh you can read more articles and recipes by Joan on our website um also please register for our virtual gala it will be featuring this year Madeline Albright Ted Koppel Andrea Mitchell Michelle Martin Tom Friedman and many more uh, Joan was actually one of our honorees several years ago so we really do ask you to please register for this event uh we could really use the support. Uh, we hope that you will join us next week when we talk about the history of Jewish involvement in politics and enjoy the night. Thank you, everybody.